The following interview was conducted with Professor Robert G. Squires, Professor Emeritus of Chemical Engineering for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, July 27, 2009 at his residence in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, Dr. Squires. Thank you. Thank you. Glad, um, glad you could come. And tell us a little bit about where you were born and your early years. I was born in uh, western Pennsylvania, a little town called Ambridge. Uh, Ambridge was named after the American Bridge Company, the large structural steel c a company on the Ohio River, which was the largest employer of our town. And uh, I went to grade school and junior and senior high school there. My dad was the superintendent of schools, so I had to be very careful. <laughs> what was any activities? Tell us about what high school was like. Did you was it close to where you lived and I walked to school. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All junior high and uh, senior high grade school, they were all within walking distance of my home. And the the, the town was probably twenty thousand, so okay. it was a small town. Sure. And uh, but I think a good school system and uh, I, Do you have uh, any siblings, brothers or sisters? I have an older, old. I had an older brother, four years older than I was. Uh, four years is a little too much to really. You know, it's a difference. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. I think two is a better. Our kids are closer together, but sure. four years. Uh, yeah. You know, he's driving a car, and I'm still pedaling a bike. And the time I got to the You're car, high school, he was in he's college. in college, and you know, <laughs> exactly. that makes a difference, exactly. right? Yeah. But. Uh, yeah, he was a fine fellow, but I just didn't get to know him real well sure. because of that. Yeah, what came at, and where'd you go to college? Tell us about college. I went to uh, RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York, uh, for four years, and I enjoyed it very much. What did you major in? Chemical engineering. Okay. Yeah. How did you happen to select that school? Any? Oh, to be honest with you, it probably was influenced mainly because my brother went there before me. And so I had been there quite a few times when my parents would go up to see him and whatnot. I was familiar with the school, right. and he had good things to say about it. So I looked at a few other places, but this one. that's the one I went to. Right. Did you live on campus, or what was I lived in a fraternity house. Okay. Uh, just off of campus. I could walk to classes from, from the fraternity house where I, of course, I lived in a, a everybody there uh, lived in the dormitories the first year, uh, and then uh, if you joined a fraternity, you would you would uh, go into the fraternity as a sophomore, which is what I did. And uh, so for my last three years at RPI, I lived in the fraternity. Sure. House. Okay. And uh, any student cl clubs or organizations that you belong to? You I belong to some. I don't even know if I can remember yeah. which ones there were. I had. You know, I wasn't. Uh, you kept tremendously you. involved, but I was involved in, in some. And then you had your things I was, with uh, the I know uh, one of the things I was particularly interested in was a radio station. They had a what they called WRPI, and I got involved with that early on and was uh, active in that. Mm -hmm. It was kind of fun. But uh, Well, then what, uh, what came next after that? Well, time? after the undergraduate days, uh, 50 C... 53 to 57 was RPI. Okay. 53, I wrote these down, so I couldn't get my yeah. dates right. Yeah. In 57, I went to the University of Michigan for graduate school. Okay. In chemical engineering? Chemical engineering again. I stayed there for five years. We gra I graduated with my PhD. Uh, my ma I got a master's in. What happened is I went up there and I majored in chemical engineering. But I was interested very much in mathematics. And so I took a, a lot of elective courses in applied mathematics. And I forget, I had you know 25 or 30 hours of mathematics courses. And uh, a chap from the math department called me in. He said he kept seeing my name oh, on the, the mathematic course. roles, and he didn't know who I was, you know. Sure. And I explained that I was a major in chemical engineering and just taking all the math because I was interested. And he told me, and I didn't realize this at the time, he said, you know, if you take two more courses in, in pure mathematics, we can give you a master's degree in mathematics. It turns out they didn't require a thesis, uh, just uh, 30, 30 some odd hours. But I had to have a couple of required math courses. 
So I did. So I ended up with both a master's in chemical engineering, which is what I was studying for. Sure. And I kind of got this master's in mathematics as a... Accumulated. Yeah, just add-on, you know. Sure. And then uh, I went ahead and got my PhD. Mm -hmm. Studied studied under Professor Parabono, a fine, fine fellow, in the air, general area of uh, heterogeneous catalysis, catalytic reactions and this sort of thing. And I graduated from there in 62. And I had done some teaching while I was a student at Michigan. Uh, they had, uh, I was on what's called a National Science Foundation Fellowship at Michigan, which paid for basically everything. I was married, I got married after undergraduate school. Did, you meet, NSF, your, did you meet your wife at, uh, at, Brent, at RPI? My wife and I actually grew up and I knew her. Uh, from home? From home. Okay. But when we got married and we, we settled down in Michigan, okay. and our first three kids were all born while I was still a student at the University of Michigan. And uh, while I was there, uh, because I was a National Science Foundation fellow, uh, they had a rule that you, they were paying you to go to school, in effect. And I wasn't allowed to, to uh, have another job that would take time away from what they wanted me to do. They were paying me to study. Full time. Yeah. So, but I called, contacted the National Science Foundation to explain that I had an opportunity to teach and I thought it would be a good experience for me. And uh, I wouldn't uh, accept any money. I mean, they couldn't pay me to teach as a job. But for the experience, they agreed that I could do that. So I taught two or three courses uh, in, in my last years as a PhD student while I was still a student at the University of Michigan. Courses in uh, the chemical side of chemical engineering, chemical reaction engineering, uh, chemical thermodynamics, stuff like this. And uh, enjoyed it very much. And it was probably because of the experience I had teaching while I was there. Also, Michigan State University in Oakland. The campus in Oakland. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it, when I was there, it was just opening up what was an extension of uh, Michigan State, the Oakland Extension. It's now, I think, a separate school. Anyway, they needed someone uh, to start their technical program. And they came to the University of Michigan to find someone. And because I was a graduate student there teaching already, they hired me, and so I was the faculty of the MSU Oakland for a while, and I taught different science subjects and whatnot, mathematics and science, and enjoyed that as well. Anyway, I had quite a bit of teaching experience while I was still in school, uh, which led me to interview sc schools, including Purdue, when I graduated. And so in 62, when I was looking for a full-time job, I did in a few, few companies. Yeah, I was going to ask you. But I, I really, uh, I don't think I was, I, I, I think I knew even then I really wanted to go into teaching. And so uh, I came directly to Purdue uh, from Michigan. But the, the head of the school at that time said that he likes his faculty to have some industrial experience. And since I never uh, worked full time in industry, he insisted that uh, in the summers, you try to that instead of doing any teaching, I would go into industry in the summers. And so I had, I've had four or five summer sessions where I work full time in industry, but just for you know three months. But that was a good thing to a good thing to do. I'm glad he he did that. Mm -hmm. And so I've been here at Purdue. What was the campus like, and where did you live when you first came here? I think there were seventeen thousand when I first got here, and we lived out on. I don't know what you'd call it now, uh, North Campus. Anyway, if you drive out the stadium and, you, and, and keep, keep on going all the way out, you pass what now are a bunch of fraternities right, on, on, okay. a, on, a, on a road that kind of goes to the right, ends up in the golf course. Right. Well, that, there weren't any fraternities when we were there. But there were houses but there? But there were little houses up in there, and, and we lived in one of these little houses that were eventually torn down to make way for these fraternities sure. that are there now. Sure. 
But it was delightful because the golf course was, was right, right in our here. backyard, you know, and, and uh, all the other little houses were occupied by other graduate students because they were all renting from the university. Right. So yeah. it was a delightful place right. to live. It was close to campus as well. Yeah, they could walk to work, That's walk right. to campus. And football, so etc. It was quite nice, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we had, we don't get football tickets anymore, but we did for many, many years. Sure. I enjoyed that. And right. Uh, it was a, a good place. Right. Yeah. Well, tell us when you got started and what, uh, uh, what you did in the school and also your research. Tell us a little about that. Well, as I say, my research was in uh, heterogeneous catalysis, and uh, I was studying uh, chemical reactions that were accelerated by catalytic agents. And, uh, but the way it works at the, the university, you don't actually go in the lab and do the research yourself. W what you do is try to attract graduate students who, who would, uh, as part of their research, do your research, in effect, do, or work in your area anyway. Under your supervision. Under my supervision. And so when the, when the work was completed and you tried to submit it for publication, typically uh, the st graduate students would name it beyond the work, but so would mine. Even. So, uh, so all of my publications, and I forget how many I have now, but are this type of thing where it was done in conjunction with a graduate student right. and uh, that really is I think part and parcel of graduate research is being involved with intimately with a graduate student in yeah, a research right. area right. and all of my research well I think almost all of it was uh, what I would call experimental research you were taking data and trying to explain what was happening and this sort of thing sure right. I, I didn't do a lot of theoretical work it was mainly experimental work right. What was that, uh, something I read, Bob, that uh, catalog on catalysts that you did or worked on that? 19 Say again? Catalog on catalysts. You were doing some sort of work and there was an article about that. It was about in the 60s. Well, again, okay. catalysts were my thing. So you were doing some sort of a catalog yeah, or something yeah, like that. I don't remember specifically. Yeah. But the other thing I think was nice that uh, I read also that when you first came, you had coffee and conversation. You had the students come yes, over to your house. We, we, That's wife, a little bit like the, the FAC Fellow Program. My wife and I have done that for for years, really. Uh, the only rule I had, uh, what I would do is have a class, say thermodynamics or something, with maybe 80 students in. It was very hard to get to know them in a, a big group like that, and I would just say, "There's, you know, don't feel you have to come. You know, it's not going to affect your grade in the course. But if you'd like to come, I would invite them over, say eight or ten at a time." And once every two weeks for, uh, throughout the semester. So by the end of the semester, if everybody in class wanted to come, they would have an opportunity, you know. So, uh, and, uh, but the rule was we talk about anything except classwork. We didn't, you know, we wanted to, I wanted to find out what they were interested in, what they were doing when they them. weren't in school, you know, get to know them, exactly. Right, right. And that was a lot of fun, I enjoyed it. I think the students enjoyed it oh, too. Yeah. Well, they do with even in the FAC Fellows when they're invited to the home or they yeah. go a picnic off campus. That's the purpose of it yeah. is to get them out of the classroom and interact with exactly. them. Yeah. Exactly. And this way, you know, you get to know them so that you can see them in the hall and know who they are, call them by name. And, right. and, uh, yeah. I found that very hard. I, I'm not one of these people that can have a class of 80 and the second day of school I know all 80. You know, I, there are some professors that just have photographic memories. And they and they that recall is also that yeah. they can remember that. It's I a can. struggle for me. I I really have to work at this. <laughs> <laughs> they know you. You're one of eighty, but not the other way around. Yeah. Anyway, uh, eight at a time I could manage. Eighty at a time, and no, that no, was no, too, no. too many. Right. Yeah. But we did that for for many, many, many years. We, right. We and the cho and your children could interact with them as well. Which but they didn't much older. because of the age difference. Oh, you okay. know. Probably. So yeah. they didn't really participate in that. When they come to when the house. students much. If they were here, they might pop in and say hello, but they didn't really sit down and talk. Right. But, uh, talk about the fact, uh, and that leads into the FAC Fellow Program. Tell us a little bit. You were in, uh, at Tarkington most of the time? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the FAC Fellow is, is kind of the obverse of my having students here. It's just like they were having faculty there. And I typically would go over for meals sometimes. Often I'd go for a meal. Uh, with the idea of sitting around the table and talking with the students after the meal was over for those who wanted to stay. Nobody had to stay and chat, you know. But uh, a lot of them did. 
And again, you get to know some of the people over there. And, and Particularly, you say, on one hall, you used to get, you get yeah. familiar with and, one And uh, I didn't, you know, try to, to uh, single out the chemical engineers, you know, I just wanted to get to know everybody when I came over there, and it was, it was fun. They, they, right. they get involved with all kind of stuff and ask your advice and whatnot. They just right. wanted an older person to Did you ever ideas. do any programs? Because uh, Dr. Barony has given a couple of programs over there, I know, on the co-op, because I've been there a couple of times. There were some programs after Yeah, dinner. I've given some talks. Mm -hmm. The co-op program is uh, dear to my heart. Okay, that's uh, good. Well, that's a lead into that. That would yeah, be good. It, uh, the way the co-op pro, I'm sure you're familiar with this, but, but I'll, I'll explain it anyway for the, anyway yeah, for the right. people listening yeah. in. Uh, the idea of the co-op program is a, a student, usually during the freshman year, uh, would, would stay in school. And then they would interview, after the freshman year, interview companies who would specifically come to our department uh, and other departments to, to interview for the co-op program. And if the company decided to hire them and they, they, they accepted, they would alternate a semester at school and a semester at the company until they finished school. So because of this, well, first of all, the, the regular student went four years, but the regular student didn't go to the summer school. So uh, the co-op program, um, some of them even started in the first summer after their freshman year. So some of them had four additional semesters, four summer semesters uh, in, a, in addition uh, they would work, as I say, every other semester once they get started. And, and so most of them would take at least five years to finish. And then they would, but that would include uh, two extra years after, but also include all the summer programs when they get done. So they would really spend a lot more time uh, with the company than the, the regular student, whatever. A regular student might have one or two summer summer jobs and that's it, whereas these students might work seven seven semesters or something like that right. for a company. So uh, how did the job market affect the uh, employer uh, with openings over? Does that, were there peaks and valleys on that some Of course, years? of course. Oh, okay. But uh, a lot of companies got into the co-op program early and they had students in there for, you know, as I say, four or five years. And as Cons one goes out the basis. top, they would bring in one at the bottom. And even though the, dirt, the job market wasn't good that year, they're bringing in someone who's going to be working for them for four years in a row. So my experience was that the, the peaks and valleys in the job hiring were not as, ab as abrupt as for the in the co-op program because it was a long-term thing. And even though things were sh are tight right now, they know next year, the year after, they're going to want someone in the program. And if they don't hire someone this year, they're going to have a gap in the program. Uh, and they would like to fill that all the way along so they have some uh, a group of people working. Right. Yeah. So I find the co-op program worked uh, very, very well. Uh, did you visit the... Did, did yeah, I was very lucky, or call it luck, call it whatever you want. But one of my main hobbies... And, uh, at that time, uh, my wife and I are both pilots, and we, we belong to the flying club. So we had access to three different airplanes. And two of them, they were all single engine Cessnas, high wing Cessnas, but two of them had four seats, and one had six. Out of Purdue and Airport? They out here at Purdue, yeah. So if I wanted to visit a company, almost all these companies either had their own private airstrip, most of them did, the big companies or at least a public one very close, and they would send a car and come and get you and whatnot. But I could go to visit a company. Uh, the, the planes would do, oh, the biggest one might do 200 miles an hour. This, uh, most of them would do 150 at least. So, you know, in two or three hours, you could be almost anywhere, you know, reasonably close. And uh, it's a straight line, you know, so if I want to go like to Midland, Michigan to visit some companies up there, you know, you're there in two hours. So. Anyway, uh, and not only that, if I went, the <coughs> what would usually happen is the company wouldn't uh, sign up for me to go because if they signed up ahead of time and, and I had an accident with the airplane, then they would feel responsible and whatnot. But once I was back home and the trip was over, if I wanted to submit 
the cost of the tra travel, they would they would reimburse me for for monies already spent, which is fine with me. You see. But it meant that uh, I could take six, five other people with me in the big plane, or four, three other in the, in the fourth place, at no cost at all to the student, because we could leave, uh, say, say it was a three-hour trip even, we could leave like at seven o'clock in the morning, be there by mid-morning, have all day, lunch at the company, most of the afternoon, and we would be home for dinner. Sure, right. It was really delightful. There was no overnight, no hassle, nothing like this. And it also let the comp students go <coughs> and possibly uh, interview the company for future work and things like this. And uh, it didn't cost them anything. Right. And it, all it cost the company was what they were going to pay me anyway for my coming, you know. Sure. So because I could fly, <coughs> they made it much, much easier for me to, to participate sure. and to take students and all this kind of thing. So I, I found that. I didn't learn to fly because of this. It just was handy when I was able to do this. Because if you're going to drive to Midland, it's, a, it's all of a sudden an overnight. It's a big deal, you know. And the students have to miss class a lot more classes than they would otherwise. So that was uh, that was very handy. Right, right. I, I don't fly anymore. We quit. Do you I, still have the plane? No. Uh, I don't know if the planes. I think there's maybe one still there. Oh, okay. But uh, so you're giving up the flying, huh? <laughs> well, I, I just uh, had a heart attack in 98, I think it was, and uh, I decided to quit flying then. I mean, I recovered fully from it and whatnot, but uh, I decided that, sure. you know, if you're, it's a little different when you're in an airplane than when you're in a car, <laughs> you know, you can't just pull over and stop. <laughs> Not really. Yeah, so Not anyway, really. I just decided it was time to quit flying. Right. But it was a wonderful hobby. As I say, my wife and I both flew, and, and uh, we enjoyed trips we took. And did, for great. the researchers, did uh, many of the people, many of the students that were with the companies, got a permanent offer when they were finished, or did it, it, could that vary? Vary. Okay. And sometimes they got an offer and didn't accept it. Sure, right. But, uh, but they uh, at least had a leg Because, they're, remember, this is probably the company they interviewed when they were a freshman, sure. and they worked for it all this time. And, uh, you know, some of them worked four or five times and decided, hey, I don't want to do this all my life. Others were just really excited about it. Right. So it varied all over the map. Sure. I understand. Okay. And uh, some of them, I think, had the feeling I'd like to at least try another company to work somewhere else, even if I decide to come back here, okay. just to get a, a little variety and experience. Same with if you get your PhD at a school, you'd like to come back, but you'd like to broaden your scope sure. a little bit by doing something yeah. elsewhere. So it works the same yeah, way. I think so. Right. Um, what about the School of Chemical Engineering? Any uh, you know, That's changed over time. Of course, you got your new building. They, they built onto that, didn't they? The Forney? Yeah. Yeah. And you had your 100th uh, anniversary. Of course, it expanded. The, it kind of, oh, goodness, compared to when I when I first started, it's much more. Were you larger. in the building which was, which was known as Kim and Met, that building that yeah, is that's the, the front part of it there, isn't but it? But of course they expanded over by physics into that's that right. building as well, which they're in now, but they're in both now. But that's right, exactly. But when I was there, it was basically in the what we call the old building. But uh, I was very pleased with chemical engineering. I think the uh, administration that we had uh, was good. It, they, they went, their philosophy was hire good people and let them do their thing, and, uh, which I agree. <laughs> That's yeah. the way they should do it. And uh, uh, the students they got, I think, because of the reputation of the school, they got good students. And uh, this makes all the difference in the world if you have good people to work with. That's right. So, uh, Same graduate as well as undergrad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, and the funding was there. You were able to get. Uh, well, usually, you know, funding you had to go out and struggle for. Uh, now, sure, the department had some funding on their own, but for research, you usually had to go out like to the National Science Foundation or NIH, or de depending what kind of research you're doing, and write research proposals. Well, this is just yeah. the way the school works. Right. And so the, the major professor, myself, for example, you know, was responsible for uh, writing all these proposals and, and trying to pay my own students, in effect. That's right. So That's I, a challenge. I might have uh, four or five PhD students working for me, 
at one at one time and they're basically working full time on their research and, and mm -hmm. so you're, you really have to pay their full salary yeah. if you can on your research grants that's right exactly and, uh, and so this is uh, I think a major uh, responsibility of the major professors that's right trying to get research funding not just for himself but for the, the right. students as yeah. well Talking about presidents of the university, when you came, Hubdi was the president. And then Hubdi was here, and, and then and, was uh, Hanson. Rage Golding might have been. Oh, the head? The hurt when I, when I first came. Anyway, Brage Golding was head at one time. Okay. okay. Anyway, and uh, Hubdi was head, and, and uh, who, oh my goodness. Then uh, came. Then I'll came, never be able to. Then came Hanson. Yeah, it could well. Be. Now you're talking president. Either. Were, I'm yeah, talking about. Oh, department I'm talking heads. about head. Um, Andrews. Bray was Golding was head of my department. Now, okay. yeah. Then uh, let's see. There was Ronald Andrews was also in there. Ron Andrews and uh, Rickolitis. Rickolitis, so, yeah, he was uh, head. Yeah. Of our department. Right. More recently. Right. And Ron Andrews was. Mm -hmm. But uh, I work with all these folks, and as I say, we were very fortunate. I think in the choice of the, of people that we that, that we got, sure. they were. I mean, they were all, they were on faculty usually. And the, so they were good chemical engineers and we wouldn't have hired them to be a faculty member. But fortunately, they were also pretty good administrators, you know. And good math. You don't necessarily uh, find both in a lot of people. <laughs> I, I hear you. <laughs> yeah. So, oh. But I was, I, I think uh, the chem -E department's been very fortunate in the, in the quality of the leadership that they've had over the years. Sure. Did you serve in any uh, university committees at all, Dr. Scott? I'm sure I did. Oh, it's, were you in the Senate at all? Yeah, oh, I was okay. on the Senate. And I, I've been on... A lot of school committees, too. Oh, yeah, right. but a lot of the university committees Of course, well. that co-op program takes quite a bit of time. I was on, on a lot of safety stuff as well, so it was oh. one of my things. I was... A, I set up a safety committee in our own, in our own school. Okay. And, and you can't very well do that and then turn down appointments to safety committees elsewhere, you know, so I was on uh, quite a few safety committees here and there. For the well. researchers, what sort of, what were they specially taking care of as far as safety is concerned? Uh, what was the, the committee, what, what work was it involved in when you were working on that committee? Well, we, we would have safe safety policies okay. for the way, you can imagine in chemical engineering, there's obviously a lot of research with with chemicals, right? Okay. And so the the idea of, in the of how do you handle the chemicals in the workplace safely? Right. Uh, make sure that you're aware of the that flammability limits and, and explosive uh, potential and things like this right. of what you're working with. And uh, particularly chemicals, if you start mixing chemicals together in your work, sometimes you know this chemical A and chemical B themselves aren't dangerous, but you put them together. And, and you get a reaction. be a hazard that wasn't there before, right. and you have to be aware of these things. That's you know. right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, the strategic plan. But, uh, were you involved in that? Oh, On some of the committees. Okay. Uh, then the school, of course, had had its. Of course. Plan. Yes. Yeah. Um, were, did, what about the advi advisory committee? The school had advisory committee of in industry people. Yeah, they did, and. Uh, I got to know quite a lot of the, because of my involvement with co-op, right. uh, and because I, I probably visited companies more than any other faculty member, because of the airplane and because I went. Went there. I tried to, whenever I had a student who was co-oping and he would be on campus a semester and then at work a semester, I tried to visit any student who was at work at least once during, during, the, during the, the semester they were at work. Okay. And that would involve a, a flight to the company and, and uh, usually uh, lunch with all my students who I either brought with me or who were working at the company and the company officials usually would get together for lunch because I'd usually leave before dinner, you know. Sure. And, uh, and then what would happen usually is I would ask my students who were working at the company to give me a tour of the department or the, or the laboratory, or whatever they were working in, Good. and explain to me, to let me know what they're doing. And of course, that involved quite a bit of preparation on the part of the student, you know, because they wanted to do a good job. And so uh, I gave some uh, 
presentation skills, able to exactly. interact with. That's exactly. right. And some of them gave presentations. We went to a conference room or something, and they gave more of a formal presentation. Others, it was informal uh, as we toured the lab or something like that. Right. But, I left that up to them. On your companies with the co-op, were a lot of them Indiana companies, or um, not necessarily all, but they were spread geographically? Spread all over the place. Okay. It not just turns out that I don't think I call Indiana a hotbed of the chemical industry, you know. Right. Uh, Houston, some of the, you know, the, the uh, oil companies and whatnot will have, well, of course, there are a lot of chemical engineers who work directly with the oil company, but they would also be associated chemical divisions and whatnot of these companies as well. Uh, DuPont, uh, Monsanto, uh, Dow Chemical, and Midland, right. but there aren't a lot of chemical companies in, in the right. state of Indiana, so uh, we didn't uh, not have anybody in Indiana. We certainly had some, but I think we had a lot more elsewhere than we did here. Most of those companies were outside the state yeah. of Indiana. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Let's talk a little bit about some of your awards and honors. You're in the Purdue University Book of Great Teachers. Pardon? And you're in the, great, the Purdue University Book of Great Teachers. I am, huh? Yeah, I so. <laughs> okay. And you got the Charles Murphy Outstanding Award. Yeah, I've, uh, I don't really know who voted on all this kind of stuff or whatnot. You know, but I was nice always absolute, all, absolutely delighted when I would win something. <laughs> but... Uh, well, one of the ones that I think is nice, that National Catalyst Award from the Chemical Manufacturers Association for Excellence in Chemistry and Science. But this was more uh, for my research. That's okay. But uh, I've personally thought of myself more of a teacher than a researcher. Not that I didn't do the research, I did. But when I thought of myself, uh, it was uh, as a good teacher, yeah. tried to be a good teacher anyway. And so uh, an award that was based on excellence in teaching was something that I was... Very special. Yeah, very special to me. That's right. And, uh, and, I, and I won a few of those along the way, as you said. And right, uh, yes, I know you have. And uh, the, also in 19, 1993, an outstanding chemical engineer. That's very nice. No. no. Well, <laughs> see, we got all these things here. Um, you won in '78. You got that Western Electric, uh, some fund award for excellence undergraduate engineering instruction. Yeah, that was an instruction award right, as well. Right, which is really nice. Yes. Yeah. It, and, uh, and then as I say, the the awards that were based on teaching are, are dear to my heart, really. Yeah, uh, that's because, right. Uh, that really Murphy is a very nice yes, award. Yes. I and then as a result of that, that's why you get in the book of great teachers. Yeah, yeah. So you have to go and look. I think there was a picture in the inside Purdue when that first went up. A little boy, he's about four or five, and he's you know the back, and he's sort of pointing at either his grandfather or great grandfather. It's wonderful, I think. What about the professional associations? Were you involved in any of those? While yes, you were here? I think all of our faculty, uh, AICHE, American Institute of Chemical Engineers. Uh, you simply, I don't know any of our faculty that, that isn't, a, isn't hasn't been a member of that forever. You know, you join that in the student chapter when and you're still a student in, in undergraduate school. And stay you with it. Stay with it while you're in, in graduate school, and then immediately when you go into university, you, you become a full member. Sure. You know, and it's just automatic. You just do this, and you're involved there, and, and when you go to the meetings uh, to give a paper or something, at any meeting, there's always a, an associated meeting of the society, and then you get involved with committee work and this right. sort of thing. So I got involved, I, again, safety is one that I often got involved with there, that some of them had subcommittees on, on, that, on safety in academia and safety in the laboratory and this sort of thing. Right. So, uh, sure. Um, you mentioned a, er, earlier, author, uh, before we logged in, you've done some sabbaticals. Could you tell us whereabouts you went on your sabbaticals? Yeah, sure. I've had, well, the way the sabbatical system works at Purdue I think it's every seventh year, you have to apply, it's not automatic, you have to apply for this. But about every seventh year, if you apply for a sabbatical, you can apply for either a semester at full pay or a year at half pay at some other, uh, usually a teaching, in my case, it would be a teaching uh, post at another university. And what I usually did, instead of going away for a year, I'd go away for six months at full pay. 
And so when I went there, the, basically I would work at the university I went to for free because my university at home was paying my full salary. And uh, this is why my wife and I uh, became so interested in England because we took three or four of these sabbaticals at various universities uh, in England. We were at, uh, <coughs> let's see, oh goodness, University of Bradford, University of Manchester. We went to University College at London, in London itself, and uh, at least one more that is escaping me. But, uh, and of course, England's a pretty small place. Uh, you, you know, by the time you do that and you travel around and give talks, when, when some of the, the universities learn that you're a visiting professor from America at a school, then they, they would invite you to come. So while I was there, I would probably visit almost every other chemical engineering department in England, you know. And so by the time you go over there four times and do all this traveling, you, you probably have met every faculty member there is to me in, in your field in the, in the whole country, you know. And uh, it's delightful. It really, it's a small place. <laughs> Compared to that's, compared that's right, to here, exactly. Let's talk a little bit about family. Did you have children? Did they any of them go to Purdue? Oh, uh, I had three kids, and all went to Purdue. Okay. Well, we told them that as uh, they had to decide what they wanted their field to be. But as long as Purdue had that field, uh, they had to make a good case not to go there because it would save so much money. You know, not only are they in-state, but because I'm a faculty member, I get a, a, right. a, a discount, you know, and whatnot. Right. And, and besides, it's a very good school. Right. <laughs> I mean, uh, right. they aren't taking second-rate uh, mm -hmm. place. I mean, it's a good school. So all my kids went to... Okay. Went Did any of them major in chemical engineering? No. None of them major in engineering at all. Oh, okay. Uh, they were in education and this sort of thing. Well, Wendy started, she, she, she I'm, I'll take that back, she ended up in industrial engineering. Okay. She, they used to, used to joke and call it imaginary engineering. <laughs> but anyway, she, she did get a, an engineering degree finally. Okay. But uh, the other two were in, in the, more the education area. Okay. Uh, do they live, where are they living now? Two, two are near Detroit. They're all in the state of Michigan. But two of my girls live uh, in the suburbs of Detroit, and one is in Grand Rapids. I mean, Wendy is in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Okay, okay. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about uh, your retirement activities. What have you sort of been involved oh, in? Oh, my goodness. Probably travel was my... Okay. Well, uh, first of all, let me just say the co-op. Let me say okay. a little about the co-op sure. program. Okay. Now, 59, you said it started. I don't remember. I mean, you've got to find out when I first joined it. This is not you, but in your school, the year was 59. School, school of Chemical Engineering. That's right. Um, I quit teaching in 90, 98 or 99. Okay. But I, I kept on with the co-op program until, I think, 2004, about five years after wow. After I finished teaching completely. I was, That's very nice. I was still involved with the co-op program through the department. And, and again, this shows... Uh, how committed I was, and, and still am. I don't do anything anymore, but I, I just am absolutely convinced on the, the all the positive aspects that the co-op program has for the student, as well as the department. And uh, that's certainly reflected by my interest in continuing, even even after I was sure, retired. exactly. Yeah. And you had the good contacts, and you knew the students, and sure. it just, it's a win-win situation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, uh, even though I wasn't teaching, the department would continue uh, supporting my trips to visit the places and all this sure, stuff. That's right. So it was, uh, What's the fun. average number that uh, over time that you get? Oh that my marriage? goodness, I have no idea and I don't know what's happening right now. Yeah. I would imagine but some of your third to a half of the students That's a pretty good size. That's a pretty good would, size. If I had to pick a number, I'd say 40 percent. Right. And you have to follow up with them too. Oh yeah. yeah. yeah sure. So it's a lot of, lot of involvement. It's a, oh, it's yeah. a big commitment. But it's a good program, so it works yeah. out. Yeah. Now, I don't know, in the, in the 10 years since I've been gone, uh, Professor Howes, Neil Howes oh. was in charge of the program in the department, but he was also in charge of the overall engineering co-op program because all the other engineering disciplines had co-op programs sure. as well. And Neil Howes in our department was in charge of, oh, of the whole shebang. 
and uh, I think he took over in our department after I, they wanted to get someone else to continue it, and so he ran it for a while, and of course, he knows what he's doing, but I, I, I have no idea right now how many how many students sure. they have or how well it's doing. But it gives, at least for research, it gives a feel for all of the years that you were involved in it, what the numbers were, so they were pretty good. Yeah. Re really good, okay. Um, let's ask, could you have a uh, Purdue tradition that you'd like to share with the researchers? A tradition? Mm -hmm, oh comes. my goodness. Anything special? Yeah. Well, no. you've got football. You mentioned you used to like to go there. Yeah, but you know that's a that's well something yeah. the Boilermaker. Well, ran, uh, Rowdy or Purdue Pete or something like that, or the yeah. Boilermaker special. <laughs> <laughs> I just uh, I, I enjoyed the traditions that I found that were already there. I, I just certainly didn't establish any right. unique traditions and of my been own. And they going for a long time. <laughs> that's right. And it's nice, you know. Yeah. Yeah. What about uh, an outstanding event in your life? Doesn't necessarily have to be. Oh my but goodness! Comes to mind. Well, I think, like most people, I'm very much involved with my family, right. and so it, it involves the kids and grandkids. I got five five little Very ones nice. now, and they're not little anymore. Of course, they're probably fifty almost. <laughs> I think of them as little anyway, and. Uh, we don't have any great grandchildren yet, but we do have a 21 year old granddaughter that not married yet, but anyway, uh, the potential is there. Sure. For, uh, well, in reflecting back and in closing, any, uh, I'll leave it up to you to make some closing comments as you look back or look ahead in chemical engineering or anything special you'd like to elaborate a little bit on. No, I just hope that the people who are there now and in the future have the the same kind of experience there that I did. Uh, I was, uh, as I mentioned before, was very pleased with the, not just the, the faculty we had, I'm sure they're still good, but their administrative skills when I was there, I felt were, were very good. They didn't try to interfere with what you did. They tried to get good people and then step back and let them do their thing, and which is uh, completely in agreement with my philosophy. Right. And. Uh, this idea of uh, my involvement in the co-op program, uh, the university uh, enabling, allowing me to fly the plane and all this, and, and working out the pay after, so because I couldn't have afforded to do all this out of my own pocket, oh, you know. No, no, no. But the, the, they were willing to pay me when I got back after the fact to support all this travel and, and enable uh, forty percent of the students in our department who were co-ops to basically travel all around the country and see many different companies, you know, because I'd be going, you know, and have three empty seats or, or five depending on the plane, and sometimes students would come up and say, hey, I hear you, you know, you're going to this company next week. I'd, I'd never been there. Think, think I, I could come, and, and I'd say, sure, why not? Should we have a, an empty seat for you, you know? And basically at no cost except to miss a few classes. Right. And I think... Uh, that it was a the wonderful program. opportunity for the students, right? Yeah, and there were some <coughs> other faculty who were also co-op coordinators in your school. No, no, in, in other, other schools. schools. Okay, who uh, basically went to the s many of the same. You know, if a company ho uh, hires chemical engineers, they probably hire electricals and mechanicals and whatnot as well. And so my cohorts uh, or my uh, Counterpart, counterpart is a better word, and the, the other schools would also like to visit these companies. And so if they knew when I'm going to fly somewhere and I have an empty seat, and I would call around and say, hey, I'm going to go up there, would you like to come and set up a visit for yourself at the same time? And so this was good for Purdue because in effect uh, someone else could go, and good for the company because they only have to pay one transportation costs and get two co-op coordinators coming at the same time. Good you know. planning. Yeah. Good planning. So that often happens. And uh, I, I just think uh, if I had to go back and ask, it, is there any one thing that I enjoyed the most at Purdue, it would probably be the co-op program. I just think the co-op program uh, is a wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful program. And uh, if it hadn't been established, I would have been proud to be a Someone who helped establish it, but it was uh, it was already working, you know, sure. when I when I took in. Right. 
He took it and, and ran with it. Yeah, and I just good. think it was a great program for the yeah. students and for the department. Right. Dr. Squires, I want to thank you very much for this interview. It was very nice. Thank well, you very my much. Pleasure. <clears throat>